Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the 805 Uncensored Podcast. It's been a couple of months since I put out any content, so to say I'm excited for this episode would be kind of a Mount Everest-sized understatement. Anyways, thank you for tuning in to the podcast where we discuss politics, music, history, spirituality, and more from a radical perspective. I'm your host, Jordan. This is episode number 66. So join with me or several absolutely brilliant guests. I'm thrilled to introduce Heather, a writer, regular on the show, host of her own podcast, uh, Schmidt Talks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, We also have Sam and Johnny joining us from Hawaii to represent the Punitic podcast. Sam joined the podcast for our two-part episode on imperialism in Hawaii and Cuba, but this will be Johnny's first time joining. And then we also have Elide coming from San Diego, host of the Modern Cinderella's podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So my first question for you guys is, what what does it mean to uh, decolonize something? What comes to mind when you conceptualize decolonization? Uh, should I go first? I could go first if you want. Yeah, go ahead and take it. Uh, when I like think of the decolonizing thing, it's more of a uh, it's a decoupling from the logic of imperialism, of uh, serving the imperial core and its needs rather than the needs of the locals and uh, those who live here. Um, when I conceptualize decolonization, there's two very different kinds of conceptualizations that happens here in Hawaii. One is a kind of a, a, a return to pre-colonial traditions and uh, and that as a way of uh, fighting against the colonial society and its, and its oppressive systems. And also a, a way of, um, of looking forward to a post-colonial future born out of like the dialectic of colonialism and that's the, the traditional inhabitants and that's as a leftist is one i prefer sure anyone want to add to that i think there's a there's almost an element of uh sort of an imperial mindset that gets kind of placed on like people from hawaii from being sort of under the thumb of america for so long having like lost the country to them and i think part of decolonization is like the decolonization of of the mind as well right right absolutely elliday heather do you have anything you want to add to that yeah i was you know i was reading about it a little bit more and i was thinking about it in terms of like almost like returning and i mean i'm i mean i don't live in hawaii i'm on the mainland the U.S. So I have a totally different perspective, you know, um, as someone who's not under that like imperial thumb, like you just referred to it. Um, But I think of it as like return, almost like returning to, um, you know, like your cultural, you know, returning to a culture that is not influenced by like American culture, especially when, you know, looking at your later questions, um, you know, getting away from like the American consumerism um, and kind of, you know, that, that, that mindset, you know, the, the American consumer mindset. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree, actually. Uh, you internalize a lot of that. I can't live in, at least in Hawaii, you're kind of torn between worlds a lot of the time and older generations have a little bit less of it. And the younger generations due to, I think, American media kind of being able to yeah. be inundated by it, you you really internalize that consumer mindset for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So when I think of like decolonial, de, decolonial, I'm sorry, I'm like <laughs> tripping my word. <laughs> Decolonization. <laughs> Uh, I just think of, you know, returning and not just in Hawaii, but other in other like cultures as well, just kind of returning more to a, like the, I don't want to sound like cliche, but like the roots, you know, um, more like a historical um, and reconnecting with like 
you know, kind of the essence of, of the culture. I, I agree with that most on principle. And then uh, I'm going to get in trouble for a lot. <laughs> it's, it's weird sometimes my views cause it's different. Uh, um, but I agree with returning, like, I don't want to say return to the tradition because tradition changes, culture mm -hmm. changes. The whole culture in Hawaii is not static. Uh, a lot of, of the things that people think are on the mainland are traditional, are uh, things that were made specifically to present to the mainland audience. Um, but I agree, like, authentic culture and authentic uh, understanding of the people, the land, and uh, and the yeah, the people, the land, and the culture is definitely needed for decolonization. Yeah, I wanted to ask you guys about some uh, prominent historical examples of decolonization that you could uh, think of, or at least we could spotlight in the podcast. <clears throat> I mean, there's so many to start. I guess we could. Um, oh, you can think of a lot. I could. I was having trouble thinking of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess you could talk about uh, the colonial resistance against uh, U.S. imperialism. Mm -hmm. Wasn't necessarily successful, but there's definitely a continuous effort there. Yeah, uh, one of the historical examples I could think of was Cuba. Uh, but even like now, they're they're intertwined with a global uh, capitalist economy reliant on tourism like us. Uh, so, so even though they have pushed out many of the foreign capitalists in their countries, uh, their economy is based on the 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 exchange of a culture and a and a vacation site right and that actually really flows well into my next topic which is tourism because tourism is uh, by definition neo-colonialism it's you know the most colonial of all colonial economies but at the same time uh, the countries that largely rely on colonial tourism as you're suggesting sam are the ones that are most impact impacted by it and it's like twisted paradox uh, so my question is, how do we lift up countries economically that are reliant on tourism, particularly those in the global south, while also working to uh, destroy capitalism, colonial tourism, and systemic exploitation? Ooh, you, you want me to like big revolutionary? <laughs> uh, it's a it's a, that's a big question. It's hard. Um, there have been some movements that have tried to answer this question. I particularly think of like the New Jewel movement in Granada, who uh, they are a bit tourist economy during the time of their revolution. And they wanted to, to nationalize all foreign owned hotel, hotels and, and uh, make sure that those hotels services and uh, goods are produced on island and by their Caribbean neighbors. Uh, they also wanted to make sure like their Grenada tourism was not just for rich white people. They wanted to bring the working classes from all across the Caribbean and Africa. At least these were a few of their ideas, in which they're not bad. Uh, it's just unfortunate what happened to them. Right, right. It's, uh, it's difficult to lift up economies without infrastructure and Building infrastructure is very difficult. Well, I think also, like, there has to be, um, like, a will. Like, we, like, the, like, those of us here, like, we are interested in lifting up the economy while simultaneously, you know, lifting that decolonialization. But do, do most as an example, Americans, like I was thinking about this earlier today in preparation for this, like, do most Americans even want to, like, do they care? I don't mean to sound cynical, but do they? And it's like, without, <laughs> without that level of, Fuck no. <laughs> without that level of support, it's like, 
for me, I start thinking about, well, how can we start instead of like, for me, I don't even think about like, how can I support, you know, an economy during this period, like this, this change or whatever. Like, I think, well, what do I need to do here at home to change other people's attitudes? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, like, it's so hard to answer this question in my view because there's so few people that really seem to to care enough to want to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was looking at uh, in my research going over through what ecotourism is, and it sounds very nice, you know, just go on walks and just don't <laughs> participate in the infrastructure of tourism. But like, how many Americans would do that? They want the big yeah. resorts. They want the nice beaches. They want the fancy restaurants, and they want the fake hula. It's a... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's about it's it's that sorry. Uh, it's like that that sense of like American entitlement, you know. <clears throat> and so I quite like it's hard. It was hard for me. Like when you sent out these questions and when I've been thinking about this, it's been hard for me to really articulate an answer because I feel like there there's so much work that needs to be done to to change the paradigm so that people like even want to do it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and that's why, Jordan, I uh, my like the questions that I was thinking of for you we're all like okay well what can we do like early on in education you know um will that will that change people's attitudes about it um but i don't know well from a place of where they have put a lot of effort on educating uh at least us locals and they try to educate the tourists but they've spread like uh there's been like that misrepresent our myths, that misrepresent our history, just to make an easy buck. Uh, but yeah, uh, I was I was going to get to education later on in the show, but yeah. while we're on the subject, I can I can actually ask your question, which was: uh, Should ethical traveling be included in core curriculums as a strategy for educators to teach ethical traveling practices? I mean, it might not be enough, but it can't hurt. Yeah. Yeah, and we, the ethical travel thing, we, most people in Hawaii try to practice that and tell those who we come in contact with to practice it. Uh, You know, no touching the the turtles, uh, don't litter, don't, uh, you know, respect these sites. Uh, But, you know, we can't, a lot of people feel entitled to the land and the culture because they paid for it. They bought it. It's been commodified and sold to them in a way that we really have no control over. I mean, most like you've seen a number of these game shows. A lot of people degrade themselves to no end to a trip for a trip to Hawaii. <laughs> and I think that it's not even I think it's not even like unique to Hawaii. Like, Jordan, do you remember at the beginning of the pandemic when a lot of places were closed down and there was that hiking trail up in Ojai um, called the punch bowls and all these people were going there and they were just fucking trashing these hiking trails. I mean, one of the supervisors went up with like a team to clean it up and it took them a good eight hours because people just completely trashed it. And so it's like, it's not even unique to uh, to Hawaii so much as no. it's just no. the way we are, you know? I remember during the, the lockdowns, people were begging for tourists not to come. Just not to come. Like, it's not the time. Like, please don't, don't bring COVID here because we're doing a better job than most to keep it out. But tourists would just fly here rip their masks off on Ali'i drive and they 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 felt like because they paid they could have whatever they want here it didn't matter they would be angry if the weather wasn't perfect if the hotel didn't have the perfect amenities that they they demanded and that the locals did treat them with aloha 
<laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. So where do you guys think in order, um, I mean, maybe it doesn't necessarily have a right or a wrong answer. Where does educating yourself and then direct open-ended communication with people directly and ancestrally impacted by colonization fall into place? Mm, not quite sure. Uh, I imagine though, like, it depends on your relation to the uh, Imperial Corps, because, I mean, in my situation, I'm a I'm a colonizer, <laughs> and uh, how I came to my understanding of the world is through contact with uh, with people here. I imagine those on the mainland could only really get education through the, about it through educating themselves, because uh, they don't have access to such contact. Yeah, and, uh, I would agree. That contact is critical too. It can you can really sway someone when they kind of know the realities of it from somebody experiencing it. Yeah, yeah. You guys have anything else you want to add, um, Heather or Elida? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I heard something. Yeah, I can hear you. No I, I, I hear my echo. I don't know if the quantity of the sound is good. Um, let me try to put my headset on and see if that was a hear my voice. Sure. I don't know. We're ready whenever you are. Uh, are you gone? I've been thinking of this kind of joke idea and where uh, like, uh, yeah, go ahead. Tourists are those that follow the ideology of tourism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it's an ideology inherently with uh, um Inherit with privilege and uh, damn it, words always disappear when I need them. I've said it twice. <laughs> Entitlement? Entitlement, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is the exact word. So I Thanks. I wanted to now touch on the uh, the environmental impact of tourism. So Quote, of travelers' expenditures spent on all-inclusive package tours as a whole, 80% goes to airlines, hotels, and other international companies who, whose headquarters are located in the global north, and not to local businesses, um, estimates in the UN Environmental Program. Because that's what we always hear, like, from pushback of people, right, that support capitalism. They're like, well, you know, it's, at least it's going to the people on the in those countries. At least it's going to the, the owners of the local yeah, shops. Yeah, those, those are the same people who support trickle-down economics, and it makes the same sense to them as that did, uh, where if you support the big companies, that will somehow trickle down. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know... It, because we sell our own environment, it really looks nice. <laughs> right. So and, let's talk figures here. So in a tourism dependent country like Thailand, for example, 70% of all the money that's spent by tourists leaves the country. That figure is 80% for the Caribbean, perhaps the all-inclusive capital of the world. Um, let's avoid cruises. I, I fucking hate cruises. <laughs> <laughs> Waterborne version of the all-inclusive resort because they also destroy reefs and pollute local waters. Not to mention their petri dishes for COVID, other viruses. Um, also, there's a lot of crime on cruises. Have you guys heard about that? Like rape, sexual assault, they're pretty rampant on cruises. Yeah, I've got a friend who worked on a cruise ship for a while. It's, it's bad. 
Yeah, this is an anti-cruise podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one specific current example of environmental destruction set forth by tourism is in Bali, Indonesia, where a tropical city with seemingly unlimited rainfall is actually running out of drinking water because of tourism. Um, there's a little chart I pulled up in my notes here which indicates that tourism uses 65% of Bali's water and it's causing a crisis. And note, 85% of Bali's tourism economy is controlled by outsiders, also known as the Global North. And the whole bunch of that water goes to, what is it, like a golf courses. Golf yeah. courses everywhere take up so much water. And it's not even just Hawaii and Thailand and probably like places in the Southwest and the places running out of water still have water to make their golf courses real nice. You ever heard of this place uh, in California called Palm Springs? <laughs> I've heard of it. <laughs> it's well, familiar, even, yes. <laughs> even, here, even here in Ventura County, where Jordan and I are, we have golf courses that are all exempt from the the rules with water so like we're we like seriously are at the risk of running out of water by the oh end. if that's not an example of class warfare yeah and so and so we all have to cut back to one watering a week and everybody has to take a two minute shower and you're not supposed to wash your dishes but the fucking golf courses are allowed to water once or twice a day <laughs> I got an idea. Everybody <laughs> should use the bathroom on their golf course. Let them wash right. away. <laughs> but it's just, uh, like you just yeah. said, it's like a class, it's a class warfare and they're appealing to, uh, again, even like a local tourist economy, right? People that mm -hmm. want to come and they want to like have their fun and, 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 and that's what that's, that's allowed, you know, we're, we're losing all of our water for that. I hate golf. Yeah, <laughs> anti-golf podcast too. Oh yeah, it's definitely <laughs> anti-golf podcast. <laughs> I'm in the desert right now. I don't understand why we have golf courses in a desert. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's like listening to this, and it took like them a really long journey to get through like the anarchist communist pipeline. They're finally there, but they're like a hardcore golf fan. So now they're like, <laughs> well, this, I'm done." <laughs> <laughs> they don't know the history of a goal. It used to be a, a working class, but then. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can see that. I don't know. So, you guys, let's talk about these assholes on social media that say they're going on their trip to Africa. Oh, <laughs> God. Well, I, I wanted to touch on first one thing was that, like, you know, a, a normal transatlantic flight, uh, which is about seven hours, and it's like, nearly six hours from San Francisco to here, takes up more CO2 than an average person all year round. Just one wow. flight. Wow. And just going to one of these places far out of your range is doing more harm to the environment, whether you think it's an eco tour or something, than just staying home. And uh, I, you could, there's beautiful places all around the world. I don't want to stop you from going to beautiful places. I mean, but there's places you could go for less impact. Yeah. Agreed. So, uh, what, yeah, one specific example I have here, shout out to the decolonizing travel Instagram page. They have this post where this guy says, this was our final night in Dubai before we leave tomorrow for my dream trip to Africa. If you don't hear from me, it's either because I got eaten by a lion, sat on by a hippopotamus, or I just don't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> so they, they are, they're automatically jumping to animal and Wi-Fi, um, going somewhere remote, making jokes about that. Um, you know, instead of, if they wanted to make going to Africa a surprise, if they want to make the country a surprise, they could just say, um, Af I'm going to an African country, right? Mm -hmm. um, Instead, they put all these kind of stereotypes on Africa as a whole. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
I think it's a yeah, and they just kind of like perpetuate the stereotype that it's underdeveloped and just completely remote. Like there's no cities or anything there. Mm-hmm. And who knows? Maybe they are going to a place with no cities, uh, but that's not Africa as a whole. That's parts of Africa. That's parts of any continent in any country in the world. <laughs> And Africa's huge. Like, it's <laughs> so diverse in regards to, like, culture and conditions. Like, but everyone always jumps to, like, oh, I'm going to get, I'm going to be on the Serengeti and I will be stalked by a lion and some <laughs> warlord will come and take me away. <laughs> I'm going to get Ebola in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> literally the moon away but because it's connected on a continent it's lumped together in people's minds and that's what they sold for the tourists they don't sell like nuance who buys nuance <laughs> i want the setting serengeti and i want a nice hotel <laughs> uh, you want the lion stalking but like in cages <laughs> Uh, a lot of it is is 100% based on the 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 logic of uh, capitalism and imperialism. It's uh, it's otherizing um, Africa, and they other as they otherize Hawaii with their stereotypes to sell and uh, and create a good for the people in the imperial core, rather than those who live in Africa or Hawaii. Uh, yes. We're we're destination we're we're a reward for those who are good good capitalist boys and girls <laughs> uh you can visit someplace exotic where you you can see hula or you might be in by lion but that's what we're told we're selling you <laughs> <laughs> it's not the truth but that's the packaging yeah totally so um Heather's going through a bad spot right now um, with service, so she'll be able to join in a few minutes, and then Elodie's going to try to rejoin. Um, so I think we're just going to take like a five-minute break, if that's all right with you guys. Sounds good. Sounds all right, cool. Late talk. I hear something. I think that's Sam. Sam, you might need to mute.
<laughs> Dang. I really want Ella Day to come on because she's gonna she was gonna talk about um white supremacy and colonialism, how they're related to monogamy. Damn, we're missing out. She's gonna pop off. She's just gonna <laughs> get her headset to work. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, thank God. Okay. <laughs> Wrong browser. <coughs> okay, I will go on break. I will come back. I'm glad, but at least you can know you can hear me. Yeah, just come back in a couple of minutes. Yeah. All right, that's good. Anything interesting going on in uh, Hawaii right now? Uh, let's see. Let's put on this back on. Uh, there's the protests down in Waipio Valley. Um, there, uh, what's going on there? There's, well, there was a road closure because um, down the Waipio Valley, the road there is really steep. It's prone to rock falls and uh, mudslides. And uh, so they closed it for repair. But then a few months later, they reopened it for specific vehicles, four-wheel drive. Uh, and uh, tourist buses. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so they're not allowing the, the locals are up in arms because many of the local cars aren't like full four wheel drive, they're trucks and everything, but they don't go full wheel drive. And uh, they say they closed it for a safety reason, but they allow these big ass tourist vans to go down. <laughs> and so that's been a, a a hot issue. Mm. Um, we see that here. We see that here in Catalina Island as well. They have mm. back roads where they take tourist buses up, but locals to Catalina aren't allowed to to go up there. And the buses go up to like look at the. I think it's bison that are on the the island and other animals that are native to the area, and they take them up to like the airport. But again, like the, the locals that are like actually living and running the Catalina Island, like the, the island of Avalon, they're not allowed to go up there. So it's the same, it's that same, that same shit, you know? Yeah, it's, it's really frustrating because a white Valley's valley is like really culturally important. It's the Valley of the Kings. It's great for taro farming and really defensible so for like hundreds of hundreds of years it's been the like seat of power on the big island uh, and so it's very culturally important and it's it's really messing up many people's lives who live down in the valley it's fucked up <clears throat> You guys are ready to get back into it? So, yeah, my question uh, is, now that we have Heather and Ella Day back, what is the role of corporate feminism and capitalism in travel and tourism? <laughs> so if nobody wants to take that, I have a quote to read. Um, from Bonnie Amor. Uh, she says, the presumptuousness of claiming you can eradicate poverty and gender inequality by selling bracelets to yuppies exposes one fallacy of corporate feminism that leaning into capitalism can heal the symptoms of the system without actually challenging it. 
which is the entire narrative of fair trade branding. It's like, if you buy this, then these brown and black women will have better lives. But it doesn't question what it means to live under a capitalist system that harms them, which leads me to another great quote where they say, the central paradox of fair trade capitalism relies on inequity to keep these shops open. So the shops are open because the very machine that drives capitalism, that drives you to go to the shop there, it's exactly what's keeping the people in the situations oppressed in the first place. And then, but then again, it's like, we get to the point where we're like, well, what is the solution? You know, like, like, what is the solution? Because, because like you've said, like, it's, it's all capitalism driven, right? So it's like, how do we support how do we support like these communities and especially like women in these communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, do we support by not buying the bracelets? Do we, <laughs> do we support by, by, by not going? Do we support by, by, and, and what impact do we like, do we make, you know? Um, like I've been reading a lot about like sustainable souvenirs, right? And I'm like, what kind of a stupid concept even is that? Like, like, <laughs> like well, I, living I mean, in I here, get, I mean, it's trap, nice. it's, yeah. It's, yeah. There's not much economic like opportunity besides making little tourist trinket sometimes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. So, and then, it is then, part like, of the capitalist like, logic. Yeah, but and then but then like look at even even beyond like you know supporting women in like sub you know that are living in subjugation mm -hmm. or that are living in in an oppressive system, right? Like even going beyond that, look at like the like the impact of spending money on all these little tourist trinkets on like the great barrier reef like have you seen like all of the crap that they are finding in the reef and what it is doing to the reef or even like the ocean like how much plastic is in the ocean and it's like mm, like yeah, what, is the I right, agree. what is the right thing to do you know it's it's like we're at this point where what is the right thing to do because you don't you don't buy the trinkets well how can the how can the people sur thrive and survive right but if we do we also contribute to it's like a paradox right or <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a rock and a hard place and, and that's so the that's question why, right that's why... like, do we even travel at all or like <laughs> yeah but I yeah mean... it's it's one of the main issues here because like we are completely dependent upon foreigners right. and coming yes. to our island uh that and the military using uh, the land for training or a jumping off point and military bases and that's all part of the logic of, uh, of the imperial corps yeah. using us as a, a trinket a tool uh, <laughs> i get it um Am I hearing I, that the I don't, is communism? As far as... <laughs> <laughs> I'd I, like to go a step that? beyond and say we don't need a state after that, but, you know, if we do it step by step, I'm okay with that. That's always yeah, my yeah. argument with tankies, is I don't necessarily disagree, but there's a step beyond you, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm an anarchist, brother. Uh, um, but I don't know. The... As far as solution right now, I always try to say lead by example. Mm -hmm. uh, especially, at least that's how I treat women in my life anyway. Like they're as equal to me. If I think the, I like the Rojava example of uh, women in leadership, where for every leadership role, there is a, a gender, a woman and a male gender in every leadership role. And so there's never an inequality of power. And I always dug that. Uh, but it seems like capitalism tries just packages uh, packages feminism to like it packages ecological ideals, ideas and even rebellion. It packages rebellion and sells it back to something that's totally ineffective and just 
perpetuates capitalism itself. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, sells, it sells itself back to you. Can yeah. I can I add a couple of things? Can yeah, you hear me now? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Finally, woo woo. Uh, uh, okay. Corporate feminism is the evil. The main issue is this is so appealing because in a world like we are saying where the solutions are, we don't know. Uh, and the, solu the only real solution is so difficult. It is destroying capitalism, of course. Um, it's very appealing because it makes you feel good. You're helping other women. You are supporting your sister, blah, 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 blah. So that's the main problem of uh, corporate feminism. And that's the main problem of also saying things like, oh, we want more women in power because who are these women? Because if you see what's going on in Italy right now, you know, we do have a woman in power. She's a fascist. Um, so she, she brought up the equity of having also women fascist in power, which is not a great um, at more all. Um, huh? More female drone pilots. <laughs> exactly. Like so that's kinda like I'm always like when I when you know the when I hear like more like we want women in power. So it's like, which women? Because the reality is that uh, actually far right women have it easier because misogyny doesn't attack equally all the women. It attacks more women who rebel against the patriarchy. Actually, misogyny is very nice for women who support the patriarchy because they reinforce the status quo. So right now in Italy, there is this narrative. Granted, I'm going back in a couple of weeks. So then I'm going to really listen to the Italian news. It's going to be lovely. But there is this narrative that Giorgia Meloni is doing great for all the women because she's a woman. And, you know, so it's kind of like you see that we, we have no problem. There's no problem with sexism in Italy. Look, look, we have a, <laughs> like, we have a woman, a prime minister. Everything is perfect. So in I, a I certain think the Proud sense, Boys do something similar to discount the racism by having a, a black yeah. leader. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same idea, right? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because, like you know, I've been dreaming of a woman in power in Italy for so long, and now I'm like, damn it, oh. sh I shouldn't have dreamed about it because, like, that's not the woman I wanted, you know. Um, and so, um, in terms of solution, it's true that there is no real solution in this system, but I like to. Um, the approach that you know Silvia Federici has was you know my idol and it's like you know we we need to restart like having like community and a communing of things so for example she talks a lot about the um no I don't know if you remember if it's her or someone else I was reading so much about it but like com the communing of care so what's the problem about like motherhood and the fact that still a lot of the work the care work and the unpaid labor for motherhood and like just you know, work in the home is still on on women. The solution is not subsidies to uh, moms and like childcare. The solution is that we need to restart thinking about all of these like a communal good. And that's the same thing for land. If the land was communal instead of private, I mean, I know now we're going to, like, yeah, that's not that easy. <laughs> um, but if we start rethinking about something that is communal that's the fight to fight and that's somewhere in i don't know i think it's this book um a revolution at point zero zero federici somewhere it's a collection of essays i think it's the last essays where we, she talks about like um how the importance of communal lands especially in like developing countries um and another thing that I know I'm rambling because I've been keeping up all this thing and I wanted to add and I couldn't because you guys couldn't hear me. Oh no, um, this is excellent. <laughs> um, and, and also something else I was texting Jordan about, and he knows how I feel about this stuff, but uh, when we talk about um, colonialism and, and decolonizing, I think it's also important to understand how colonization affected not only you know, the practical aspects of our life, tourism, you know, everything, you know, we see, but also the way we live our lives. So, for example, monogamy is um, was imposed on a lot of like native population um, by colonizer, and marriage, as we know it now, was also imposed. Like the binarism of gender was also imposed. So, you know, when we talk about decolonizing, there is something we can do within ourselves that is not, you know occupying lands that maybe it's a little more complicated. It is about rethinking about these structures within our lives. So for example, the way we love and connect, it is created by white supremacy. That's just the reality. You know, a lot of 
um, Native American population, they didn't have monogamy as we intended because monogamy at the end of the day is linked to the ownership of especially a woman's body because monogamy for the longest time had been monogamy only for the woman. Well, men could do whatever they wanted. Um, and so uh, another book, it's called Making Not Population. Uh, and there is a whole part about how actually the, the monogamous family was created. I was looking at the, um, yeah, I was, I was trying to look for quotes. Uh, but here it says, one of the biggest targets of colonialism was the indigenous family, in which women occupied positions of authority and controlled property. The colonial state targeted women's power, uh, tying land tenure rights to heterosexual one-on-one -on -one lifelong marriages, thus tying women's economic well-being to men who legally controlled the property. Indeed, women themselves became property. Um, so this, like, you know, it connects the idea of like property, marriage, and again, marriage is existed. Actually, marriage exists in every human society except, I think, one. But it's a very different concept of like marriage and what we have right now. Um, mm -hmm. And so I like the idea when we talk about uh, uh, decolonization to think, really think also about what we can do within ourselves and the way we live our life to decolonize our life. Um, I hate monogamy, as you guys can all tell. <laughs> <laughs> That was it. Great, yeah. thank yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. Very, very true. <laughs> well, definitely can confirm that is exactly what happened here on the islands. <laughs> yep. So, on a happier note, what what does a just world look like when people are no longer oppressed by intervention of settler states or global capital from the north? Like, if we're envisioning a utopia where leftists win, so to speak. Mm, globally, locally, uh... um, I guess we'll start locally because I think that's easier to conceptualize. Well, locally would be sustainable, at very least. Uh, we would be able to produce our own food, uh, be able to produce the technologies and equipment we need for ourselves. Right, uh, I'm thinking of like solar islands. bunk. Yeah, yeah, uh, solar punk's a very good like uh, example of what we could kind of envision here. Uh, would very much like to incorporate the traditions, uh, many of the traditions of um, the native inhabitants, uh, yeah. our brothers, brothers and sisters. Uh, but. Uh, what else? Um, just be able to live easy day to day without, you know, being coerced. <laughs> no more backbreaking labor at crazy amount of hours for people mm -hmm. who don't appreciate you and just want to take apart your culture and take a piece home with them as much as they can. Right. You know, you, yes, no 40 hour work week. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Like when you're, <laughs> like when you're talking to people that like give you pushback about shit like this, where they're like, at least it's not like a, a hundred years ago where everybody's in a factory working twelve hour days. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? It's Good. not that much. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we got better. We could get better. We could keep getting better. <laughs> have to work just. We can face into green. Yay. <laughs> You know, I'm getting to the point where, like, I feel like I'm starting to get to the point where, like, this idea of, like, you know, what did you say, utopia, like a utopia, like a utopia, yeah, utopia. or, like, you know, the ideal situation. I'm starting to find myself that, like, the worse things get, like, the more I'm willing to accept as utopian, you know, like, at the, I'm getting to the point where it's like, okay, well, how about people just their basic needs are met or like how about yeah. health care how about just some health care like if we yeah. just have health care <laughs> for everybody like, like that what what if we just call that utopia you know okay so sure we all have to work you know three jobs or whatever but everybody has health care and, <laughs> and no not even that imagine <laughs> that that would be crazy insanity but it's but then I like but then I like think about it and I'm like wow so I'm like now 
you know, that like is me even oppressing like my own mind, right? Because I'm like <laughs> learning to, yeah. to just settle for this, you know, um, really garbage system that we've bought Capitalist into. Capitalist townscape. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you got nothing, you'll take anything. Right. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But then there's still like people by the millions that are like, oh, it can't get any better than this. <laughs> yeah. Or like the people who say, oh, if I didn't have to work, I would work. I'm like, are you crazy? Why would you work? Like, it's like, yeah, but how would I fill my days? I was like, wow, really? Capitalism stole your imagination. Really? You don't know how to fill your days? Do you have yeah. friends? Do you have hobbies? Do you have books? Like, what are you talking about? That makes me yeah. so sad. This tweet that I shared, it was like, no one wants to work is wild. No one has ever wanted to work. It's literally the worst punishment God can think of for Adam. <laughs> it's true. Well, and you know, and getting back to that, the question you had about like the, the trinkets, right? Or the women selling bracelets. Like, yeah. like yeah. I can't tell you how many times, like as a woman, like, I will like make like I'll knit something for one of my kids or I'll like make something for like a costume for Halloween or something or have a birthday party and I do like decorations and the first thing everyone says to me is oh my god you're so good at this you should sell it you should make you should make more of these scarves and go sell them down at the harbor you know people that are visiting they'll want to buy this kind of stuff and it's like like it it's like that ingrained in like our yeah. you know like we've like taught ourselves that that's just if if you have a hobby you know it's not really valuable if you couldn't sell it yes right? well, yes under our system or unfortunately it's made like commodifying even our most fun things uh, logical yeah like is commodifying our souls completely logical because it, it improves our, our economic conditions <laughs> and uh it's really it is quite sad <laughs> yeah so like what would you do if you didn't work oh well i would have a hobby oh well you could sell that <laughs> yeah yeah, but then it, it's a step further too like if you can't make money off of it it's worthless yeah why are you wasting your time on that yeah, that's stupid. I can confirm as a musician. <laughs> Why are you wasting your time playing oh, yeah. guitar or making anything? You'll never <laughs> make money out of it. You'll never do anything with it. Go pick up, go pick up a skill. Go learn how to code. <laughs> yeah. P people, people ripping on you know people that have like art degrees. It's like. Yeah, they didn't go into it expecting to get rich. They went into it trying to enrich themselves culturally as a person. Like, isn't well, there isn't there a lot of value to that? And you know what what we're talking about here is like how like what we started with about how can you change people's minds, right? I was yeah. talking to my eighteen year old about this, and her like favorite thing to say now is, "This is what happens when you defund the arts." And I totally agree with that. Like. Like people not critically thinking or not thinking about like the impact that they're having on others or like this cultural narcissism. This is all defunding the arts. This is not having hobbies. This is not, this is like telling somebody who wants to get an art degree, oh, that's worthless, you know, or a musician, don't, don't do that. Because that's the kind of stuff that makes you think about all of this, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I, you know, that's why, like, again, like, when I was, when you asked if I would help with a couple questions, I immediately thought about, well, how can we, like, change the way people are educated? Because if people start, like, getting art degrees again, will they be more, you know, respectful of a culture or whatever? Um, just like history degrees. When was the last time somebody was encouraged to get a history degree? <laughs> you know? But yeah, you're, if you're laughed at. Yeah, but if you're visiting Hawaii, right, and you have studied history and you know more about, like, the real history, you're going to behave differently than someone that, you know, doesn't know anything, like, doesn't know history of anything. And honestly, you'll appreciate it more. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's true of any place. You learn the history of the place, you go to visit, you will appreciate it more than if you just go there ignorant looking for a good time. Mm -hmm. Can I share my idea? It's not even easy utopian. It is a bit utopian. So, yes. okay, there is no, um, I mean, travel is limited. Let's be honest. And also, you know what? I'm going to say it. Travel is estimated. Like, it's overestimated. I think there is more stuff local that if we have, granted, you know, I live in the U.S., I'm from Italy, so I do have to travel uh, to visit my family. But if we limit trips for, like, once per person every two years, you know, and then we can maybe meet people from that place online and still get to, you know, share and see. They're just because like we cannot all travel that much. It's just the reality is too polluting. Like there's no way. And then in my utopian world, um, we will all live in communes. But this is the thing. So it will be like a big apartment complex where we each have our own like kitchenette and you know even a studio. So even smaller, it's okay. I don't need this thing. And then all the cool places are all of course shared. So you have a shared kitchen, like a cup. So you do you know you you alternate cooking meals. I'm guessing. But here's the fun part. Everyone is working only. Let's call it fifteen hours a week let's call it 15. so and you don't even need to so think about it. you reach 18 and you don't even need to divide who wants to go to college or who doesn't want to go to college or whatever because the reality is that when you work so little you can go to these or continuing education programs for example so you do maybe five hours a week of community service so you cook you clean you build solar panels you know whatever needs to be done and then you have all your afternoons or all your morning free and then you can go in my mind to all these like free university free continuing education so let's say i'm an engineer i love engineering but also i love history i love art and maybe you could say you know what in this year i study engineering in my free time my afternoons and then next year i, st I study history and who cares if history doesn't is not useful because it doesn't matter because i have my job i have my way of being useful to society but still i have enough free time that's the key the key is free time i have enough free time that i can study history i can study art and if it's not useful who cares because i do it because i'm passionate about it and i want to do it so for me the key is really freeing people's time and that's why they're pushing so much with this stupid idiocy of the 40-hour work week that is <laughs> it's not necessary we all know it is capitalism it's just profit because free time is the key because it doesn't matter you can do a crappy job but if you do it for 15 hours a week you have enough free time that you can really have a really good life that is what all we want like you don't even need to travel because you're gonna have you're gonna be sometimes when i travel i'm overwhelmed because i have so many friends around it's like well but i don't want to travel because i, I want to spend time with my friends yeah. <laughs> well, I think this gets down to even like local planning too. Like if you have like communities that are planned to be more like livable where people can live and work there, which we don't have now, like people in Southern California have to travel at a minimum. The average travel time is 23 minutes or more. People like my husband, he travels like an hour and a half work when he's working in the office and think about when you add up all that time on the road that's keeping you from that free time and the fault of that is all local politicians like their policies with you know nimbyism and not wanting to have you know the big high rises and the big apartments and all of that um and in essence not have bikeable walkable easily commutable communities they've eliminated the ability for people to have that free time. Like even Jordan, you said you were commuting here. Your commute is what, 20, 30 minutes, 20, right? Yeah, 20, 25, 30 minutes. But if there's a bad traffic day, you know, it'll be longer. And it's like, imagine what life would be like if everybody could just walk down the street and get to their office. Like, imagine how different that would be. You know, it's hard to imagine. And that's the fault of local politicians because um, they've they've planned so that we have to stay as far away as possible. Um, you yeah. know, which I, I personally think is is intentional, because if you're too busy, if you're mm -hmm. too busy to 
do all these other things, then you're, you know, you're not paying attention to what's really going on. Yeah. They want to steal, exactly. They want to steal our time. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I actually had a question that's, I think, somewhat related to this, uh, but maybe slightly unrelated, which was, uh, do you guys think that social media collectively on a global level is uh, colonizing our minds? Absolutely. I mean, they're vying for more and more of your attention as much as is humanly possible to fill every single second of your life with content. And so there's nothing left to do anything but consume whatever media the algorithm will throw at you for whatever it is that you you have, you ascribe to whatever platform you know they want to throw more of that at you as much as possible to get you to think a certain way to feel a certain way and ultimately to just consume yeah what started concerning me was a few months ago when tiktok started outperforming netflix for primetime hours so people were spending their time on tiktok watching people's you know live videos or whatever instead of watching and granted you know netflix is just you know depending on what you watch it's more tv but there are you're still you're still on social media which is so distinctly different from watching a film or a movie or whatever and so i agree they you know they just you go down that time suck and then all of a sudden you've spent you know six seven hours so i agree it's definitely colonizing our minds. I think it's just like systematically working towards diminishing like create not creative thinking, critical thinking. Um, you know, you just see a mass population of people that are just not willing to question anything. I think that really plays into confirmation bias, right? So when people whenever people just hear something that just naturally um agrees with their particular worldview, they just accept that as fact and there's no there's no questions. There's no there's no thinking beyond surface level. And then the other thing about it is like what do we get with social media? I remember a few years <laughs> ago, it's always like, you know, you see other people traveling to a certain place and then you want to travel to that place. And so then all of a sudden I've seen like 10 people that we know have all gone to the same place at the mm -hmm. same period of time, right? Like Everybody went to Hawaii last summer, and then this summer everybody went on like an Italy trip, right? <laughs> like they <laughs> are no this, this summer it was green. This summer everybody went on the Greece trip, and it was and it's like you see people see that on social media and they start to you know they they get that like serious depression that they want to to do that same thing. Yeah, um, and you have to ask yourself, would you have done that if you didn't see people doing it? You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's free That's advertisement great. for mm -hmm. uh, people willing to use their own social media to advertise certain places and things and and foods and <laughs> you see all that stuff. Uh, and I'm sure big business loves it. <laughs> oh, big business absolutely oh, yeah. loves it. The environment and <laughs> everything that we care about here on this podcast uh, hates it. Like uh, the, the Bahamas, for example, you know, if you go to the Bahamas, pretty much all the marine life is destroyed. And it's because of tourists. It's because of these all-inclusive packages in the Caribbean, which I'll repeat, about 75, 80% of those profits go back to the U.S. and the global north. So these people are just getting eaten alive. And then... Um, you know, there's, a, there's also a climate change aspect of this too, right? In 2019, Hurricane Dorian struck uh, the Bahamas. It was the strongest hurricane to ever hit the Bahamas. It was Category 5. I think the wind speeds were around 190 miles an hour. And just pretty much destroyed absolutely everything on the island. A country like the Bahamas is not able to recover from something like that versus like, you know, an impact in Florida. Hurricane Ian was really bad. Don't get me wrong. But a country like the U.S. Uh, is able to recover from something much quicker than that, than a really poor country like the Bahamas. It was just devastating. And, you know, these things are going to continue to happen. And like we're talking about in this podcast, 
these countries are completely reliant on tourism, so they, they can't go away from that anytime soon. And I, I don't exactly know where COVID is going to go, but it seems like COVID is going to continue or we're going to get another virus that could potentially um, turn into another pandemic. That was a bit of a rant, but just some of my thoughts. <laughs> you know, getting getting back to the social media thing, I remember last year when the California poppies came out, a ton of influencers like flocked to those fields, the poppy fields, and they basically trashed them. And so this year, there were large sections of the fields that were totally quarantined off where people couldn't go on them because the inf again, again, getting back to like, they just went and they trashed this area, just like the punch bowls or, you know, any area where like people that are not from there that have had no, have no respect for the area, they just go and they trash it. And it was for, you know, some selfies, right? Selfies right. with some wildflowers, like r absolutely ridiculous, you know? Um, yeah. Everybody, everybody just wants a picture. Everybody just wants to document everything all the time. Otherwise, you're not there, right? Like, it didn't exist. And like, I'm, guil I'm guilty of that. Like, I take so many photos of, well, like, well, my kids doing their stuff. Because yeah. I'm like, if, they, if I didn't take a photo, did it really happen? Well, of course it did. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's like, like... I guess, yeah, it's colonized like our brains to think that like we have to have that validation, you know? Right, right. And then, um, you know, just it definitely connects to mental health because like you said, Heather, if you're not at those places, it causes you to be depressed. You know, because you're a loser, you're, you're not doing what your friends are doing. You're not doing what um, all the cool people on social media are doing. Especially when you're normally miserable, just because when you work that much, how can you not be miserable? That's my, you know, so it kind of makes sense. But also I think that there is a lack of empathy in the sense, okay, you're going there and taking a picture of these flowers and I don't know, maybe an 18 year old, you know, you're just, you do whatever. But there is a lack of ability to stop and think, what am I doing? Am I hurting someone? And I really think we are, there are very few people who, who have it. And just like to step back and thinking, okay, I think I'm right. I think I'm doing nothing wrong, but am I? Let me, let me just stop here before I step on these flowers or whatever and think it twice, am I hurting someone? Am I hurting the environment? And I think we are not doing it because again, like we're just following, everyone is doing it, we're okay. And I find myself in those situations too, it's really difficult, you know, when everyone else is doing it, like having that additional empathy, um, it, it's hard to step away because like it's so normalized, like trashing the environment, not caring, you know, even something I find it's weird. So when my parents came to visit me in Oakland, you know, as you know, probably in Oakland, like it's full of, you know, un unhoused people. And we don't have that many in, in my hometown, especially because I come from the countryside. So my parents were very weirded out and they got so used to it that sadly enough, I was just walking by, right? Because they are like just there, like they're in front of my place. And, and my parents were like kind of almost appalled. It's like, well, you're not even like, did you see there is someone there? Like, what is this person doing? I was like, yeah, that's just a homeless person. Because like, you don't, you, it's so, this type of thing are just so normalized that it's difficult for each of us, even the people who have good intentions, I think like all of us sometimes to just step back and think um, critically about stuff. But um, yeah, I'm upset. <laughs> Sorry, every time I say something, it's just like depressing. <laughs> No, I get it. Uh, it's it's also hard to like to do much. I mean, you could invite people into your house so much, and sometimes you invite the wrong person into your house, which uh, it's happened. Uh, sometimes, but it's not much you could do without addressing the systemic problems that cause homelessness and and cause uh, like poverty. Uh, you could give away as much money as you can, and uh, it helps 
and then it helps people. <laughs> I'm not going to deny that. It, you know, you give someone money, they eat, they get cold water, they're good for at least a, a day. Um, but without really addressing the systemic problems, which seems so insurmountable. <laughs> you got like uh, billion dollar corporations like Safeway that are asking mm -hmm. you to put your money in a little charity bin so that they can just have a nice, cute little tax write-off. Would you like to round Meanwhile, up? Meanwhile, there's people outside yeah. begging for money. Yeah. Would they, uh, you like to round uh, up? Yeah. They just throw out the food, too. Like, if it's coming close to expiration, they just chuck it out. They don't donate it. They're, they don't attempt to make good on that. They could feed so much of a homeless population on the islands with so much of just the waste, the sheer waste. Yeah, I've seen so many like dystopian videos where like places are throwing away food and people are trying to grab it and feed people, and then they call the cops and they're like fucking at gunpoint. <clears throat> Absurd, because in a certain sense, you have to desensitize yourself because otherwise what are you going to do because again like there is only so much actually there is nothing like very limited we can do at the individual level so you have to protect yourself and set boundaries but then at some point those boundaries are going to make you really insensitive and almost losing that empathy that actually you need to fight the system so it's such a tricky balance between setting healthy boundaries to protect yourself. Otherwise, you're just going to suffer every day because of the world is very evil. Um, but then you don't want to put boundaries tall enough or thick enough that you really lose track of what's going on. So it's a really tricky balance. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the same for, I think that's the same for like social media and media. Like I found like a few weeks ago, I felt like absolute garbage, <laughs> just like every single day. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta take a break from the news and I gotta take a break from social media. I like, I gotta do it. And I didn't take a break from all social media, but I turned off like TikTok and I turned off all the news and I only went on Twitter like once a day and I felt so much better. But then I found like that I was getting to the point where I was avoiding like, like you just said, like what was really going on? Like, oh, there's an election coming up. Oh my God. Like, look at what is going on with COVID in my community. Like we need to put our masks back on. Like, you know, things like that. Like I found that I went too far too quick. And so I think to your point, like it's so easy for people to push it away so much that they're unaware of what's going on and and then they end up causing more problems um i think as a result um and that's so that we people have to find a balance which yeah. I, th I think yeah. i think as americans we have a hard time doing it as well <laughs> like, i agree because people have uh, like normalized themselves and it's ev they're every day they you know, check the social media what's the news yeah. What's going on? It's just a normal part of their information gathering system yeah. of uh, what's going on in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm guilty of it. I think everybody's guilty of it to some degree, unless you're Amish and what you're guilty of a different thing. But it's. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's also just part of being human is just trying to, to understand the world around you and. Uh, you really do got to try your best to understand who's feeding you the information because a lot of people are just feeding you information that uh, is um, wrong, uh, manipulative, mm -hmm. uh, and downright dangerous sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <clears throat> So I guess my, my last question for you guys is, uh, this was Heather's question, by the way, uh, cultural appropriation versus appreciation while traveling. That's a pretty interesting concept. So Heather, do you want to like kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, well, I actually was thinking about that because of all the times that I've traveled to San Diego and like, yeah. <laughs> well, because do you remember like, 
I don't know if it was last year or the year before, these two women had gone to San Diego and they had watched um, the the women in the window making tortillas. And like every time I've gone to San Diego, like we go to Cafe Coyote in Old Town San Diego mm-hmm. and eat outside and, you know, we get our little sangria and then they come and they make the tortillas by the table with us. And it's such an interesting, you know, thing to watch, right? Um, it's a cultural practice and I would never like think, okay, I'm going to now go home and make tortillas like that and turn it into, <laughs> and turn it into a business. <laughs> right. And, and then I think it was a year or two ago, a couple of women like in their twenties or thirties, they did that. They watched these ladies making tortillas in the window and they asked for the recipe and they asked to be taught and the the women said you know what no we're going to decline this is our recipe this is our culture like this is this is our this is our this is uh, this is our this is our proprietary tortilla making or whatever however you want (laughs) to you know well these these two these two young women they snuck back and they watched the tortilla making and they went and they duplicated it and they started a business and this huge lawsuit started over it. And that was when the whole conversation about cultural appropriation started um, to get like a lot of attention because, because like we do that, right? Like we, we <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would never do that with tortillas, but I've certainly like gone to, you know, uh, an art museum and looked at like a piece of, you know, Latin American art or, or, you know, old like Renaissance art and been like, oh, I could do something like that. Even that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I remember there's a, a few years ago, uh, <laughs> there was an uproar about, a, 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 I think it was a restaurant named Aloha in like Illinois or something. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody was all up in arms about it. It's like, you don't represent Hawaii. You don't know what Aloha is. <laughs> and uh, Autumn, there's, uh, there's always degrees to cultural appropriation mm-hmm. though. It's like, if you're trying to make money off it and totally rip off the like somebody's culture just for a buck, that's one thing that's obviously like fucked up. Well, that's uh, but where then I see the line. That's yeah, the but line. then there's they're trying to make a buck off of it. Yeah, then there's also the the um the white guy and dreadlocks debate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where is that cultural appropriation? Uh, and uh, I I never got this debate. It just seems to be all over on the left. But it was like, oh, it's so bad. White guys and dreadlocks. <laughs> uh, I never. It, so the, that, that's the problem. That's the kind of shit that the left is talking about. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, who gives a shit if they want to have dreadlocks and have <laughs> nappy hair? And it's their what? A, who cares? <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, like, I I think that like you can express uh, like a pr- appreciation without appropriating like if i wanted i i probably would not look good in dreadlocks but if i like wanted to if as like a non-black person if i wanted to do like a culturally african-american um you know black woman's hairstyle i would probably go and talk to a black woman about it you know to like appreciate and get their perspective and and that seems like easy to do um but then but then but then the line is drawn like when you see someone like kim kardashian she's the one who's gotten a lot of flack for appropriating hairstyles because she makes a lot of money off of it yeah you know and i think and that's the same with the ladies with the tortillas like you're they're actually making they made a lot of money at their restaurant by appropriating the 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 technique i mean it was the technique that they stood and watched and 
and stole and they didn't like take the time to even get approval or, or appreciate, you know? Um, I don't know. I think, I think that's the same balance, that same balance conversation. It's tough too when you when you when you go out and you, you you ask permission. Sometimes certain things are not just like some people can't give you permission, even if they can give you tacit right permission and acceptance that you're going to do something. It's like certain cultural practices are just kind of off the table, you know. Mm-hmm. It'd be very strange for someone to come from the mainland, and as much as I want to welcome them in, if they wanted to practice the ancient Hawaiian religion, it might be a little little squiffy there <laughs> even if i personally yeah. would probably let him and it's interesting it's it's also about so first of all i know this is silly but um as a, a pure blood italian i'm not bragging it's very lame my parents were cousins it's disgusting um but it's i kind of get bugged when people kind of you know when americans call themselves italians and they we bastardize my culture but at the same time i realized that we haven't been colonized you know well italy is it's a crappy country i don't even know how to describe it but still because we haven't been colonized and so we are not really suffering economically from these you know i don't know how it's going i don't know it's not appropriate but it, it is appropriation of, of the italian culture so I really am because we're all white. I have no stance to complain, but I see that. I mean, imagine. So it's bugging me a lot when I see these things. Like, for example, like people who have nothing to do with Italy opening an Italian restaurant and really spelling things wrong in the menu drives me completely insane. But again, I have nothing to lose. So imagine if I'm imagining the anger I would feel if it was the same thing. So I really take in my culture treating it like crap and then if i was being colonized and i my ancestors were being killed and all that stuff i would be so furious i would be losing my mind because i'm almost losing my mind now and again i have nothing really nothing to lose of course some of my not that i don't have any national pride i don't care but when i see you know jersey shore all the like fake italians that make me look like I should be embarrassed of being Italian. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. But but I cannot even imagine the, the anger and the resentment that some someone would have accumulated for like real cultural appropriation, the one that really has deeply, not only personal impact, but like a deeply economic impact. Um, yeah, the, it's the very Italian personal, it feels very personal. Yeah, the Italian culture isn't in danger of being wiped out. <laughs> <laughs> well, go to Italy and tell Giorgia Meloni that because she would disagree <laughs> strongly about it. Because now we also have the theory of great replacement, so definitely she disagrees. Oh, no, <laughs> yes. oh, I hate that. We I hate that. Creating cause... that from the U.S., we are taking it. It's ours now. We are being replaced, and uh... the, the the whole great replacement thing gets me in trouble a lot because if you it's the tourist industry in hawaii and the way gentrification works it is kind of like a great replacement in hawaii replacing the native people with white people uh mm. and so like some of my arguments kind of parallel that I'm like no i don't want to touch that fucking thing <laughs> <laughs> but i do recognize the parallels it's like they stole like the logic and applied it to are you saying that they appropriated people. the appropriation? They definitely uh, appropriated it. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else you guys want to add before we close out the podcast? Cool. It's been great talking. It's been really fun. Uh, yeah, this has been fantastic. Thanks for having me. Yeah, go ahead. And, go ahead. Wait, before we go, Johnny, Sam, plug your podcast real quick. Oh, uh, I have a little podcast where I talk nonsense here with John and maybe a couple other guests. Uh, we talk about Hawaii and the rest of the Pacific and all kinds of nonsense while listening to music. It's uh, pretty fun if you just like music from uh, Hawaii or anywhere else in the Pacific area. I try to keep it there because uh, I feel like, you know, you're only 
even locals are really only introduced to certain amounts of Hawaiian music and music made in Hawaii. Uh, and so I wanted to highlight all kinds of music here. And that was my project of decolonizing the airways. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Where can people find it? It's at uh, Punatic Radio, usually on most podcast apps uh, or on SoundCloud. Uh, I know we're on the Apple app and a few others. Um, right Johnny on. here Thanks, is a uh, regular near permanent co-host. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I got free time. Awesome. Ella Day, do you want to plug your podcast? Yeah, I haven't worked on my podcast in years, but um, everything I do is in Italian also. But you guys can find me at Modern Cinderella's Ita, Italy. Um, but there will be more news that we cannot announce to come, even if Jordan knows them. So more news in the next couple of months. Perfect. All right. Heather, do you want to go ahead and plug your podcast and your blog? Yeah, so I have a blog at schmitttalks.com, and I've been writing on there for over a decade, and I'm coming to terms with the fact that the world doesn't want to read much written word anymore the world is getting more visual and more audio and so i'm trying to expand into podcasting also but you can find that on there uh or on spotify apple um i don't know i'm still learning the whole thing so just go to schmitttalks.com and it's i mostly just talk about politics to talk about when i ran for city council um and criticize um everything basically <laughs> schmitttalks.com great all thank right. you guys so much again hope you all have a great rest of your night you too bye bye everyone good night